privilege to be here uh, to talk Infernal Geeks. Um, actually, myself is not really a geek. I'm a computer science professor in uh, School of Computing, and my area of expertise is human-computer interactions. I would like to uh, work with people to sort of improve the user interfaces, make interfaces uh, better than what they are today. And it's really an honor to talk after uh, Dr. Rivian uh, about a question. I actually get inspired just by sitting there, even though I'm trying to prepare my slides still. But, <laughs> but I, I was really inspired by when he talked about the job and uh, you know, how all production will go to zero. And being a geek is actually very important. And I, I think as an educator, we also have to think about how to modify and adjust our uh, education to suit that need. So today I will just talk about a piece of research actually done with, uh, together with my, with my students. Uh, it's talking about how can you modify interfaces with or without your source code. Okay. And before the, doing that, I want to acknowledge the, the two true heroes behind this piece of work. Uh, they are Zhang Zhongyuan, uh, Meng Xiaojun, and Huang Yongfeng, and also two of my collaborators from France, uh, James uh, Egan, and from Singapore, Raman. Uh, they are the true people that are behind making this happen. And Xiaojun is actually outside. Uh, later on, if you want to see a demo of the, of the work, you can go in and talk to Xiaojun. And we also have a paper published in ACM Chi last year. If you find this interesting and want to know more about it, you can read the paper if you like. So what does motivate us to do this anyway, right? So let me begin with a personal story. So that's my dad. Uh, he, he's a marathon runner, and he's quite healthy at the age of 71. Um, and and he, he likes to you know, stay up front and do interesting things. But when he comes to computer work, for example, he, face, he likes to write uh, articles. He, he likes philosophy, so he likes to write a lot, a lot of philosophy articles. We find the interface a little bit too, too much for him. There's so many different options, and, and, and maybe the words are not really in the right meaning that he wanted. And finding things become really difficult. So how can we sort of modify this interface just for him to create a customized interface that he can use uh, easily? But the problem of that is Microsoft Word does, does incorporate some customization features. You can go and click the settings and sort of changing some manual things. But it does not provide enough for you to make the arbitrary changes that you wanted. And if you wanted to sort of do something uh, a little more fancier or Customized, you may have to deal with the plugin uh, architecture. You have to write a plugin, and not everybody can do that. It's it's a little bit difficult, even for hackers, to write a plugin to do that. So, 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 so the, sort of getting the interface to the individual taste. If you, for example, you, this is a, a notebook, a Notepad.net, it has the two little icons here, so small, and I. I think my dad wouldn't like it. He would have a hard time trying to acquire that target. How can we change it to make it a little bit better? And sometimes you want to add new functionalities. There's a lot of new libraries available out there. Maybe you see the latest cool things on the internet, and you want to include that in your interfaces. And doing that is surprisingly tedious. It's not so easy to do. So how can we change things when we don't really necessarily have to touch the source code. So that's the question that we offer to you guys. I know that you guys are hackers. Some of you already probably have some solutions on how to solve this problem. Here is a general overview uh, of what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do here is that we want to create a visual WYSIWYG environment for you so that you can import the interfaces from a third party software and modify it in a visual way, and then you export back into your host applications. This can be done without writing a single line of code, and it can be done with some simple coding as well, depending on what you want to do. So for example, I want to add a widget called undo all or redo all, right? That, that's not available in the original interface. How can I do that? Or if I want to delete some of the widgets because they are just excessive. You know, today, there's so many different features. If you open Adobe Photoshop, for example, it has like 3,000 features. How many of you actually know there are 3,000 features in Adobe Photoshop? How many of you use every single one of them? Probably we only use about 10% or even 5% of that, right? The rest of it is not necessary for individuals. But, but on, the, 
On the other hand, collectively we have different needs. So it is it do need to have these functionalities, but we want to individualize that if, for you if we can. And we want to modify part properties, such as if you want to use this software from one country to the other, we want to translate these label names and change its font size because my dad's vision is not as good as us. Or change the background color to make more contrast. Or even change the icon to make it more intuitive. And many more things we want to do with the software. So this is what you can do with weight. You can use weight to change all that without even sort of writing a, a single line of code. And you can even add event handlers, you can add new menu buttons or new property and behaviors to the software just by writing some very simple line of code. Of course, this is not, we are, we are not, although we are doing research innovation, we want to claim that everything is done by us, but actually we have, we have been inspired by many previous work. There are some works that actually already, already allows you to modify your interfaces without touching the, the, the code itself. There are work called uh, Facade, which it does is that it actually just look at the, the GUI layer, the top layer, the pixels, and allow you to kind of manipulate the pixels and rearranging them to an interface that you like. And there are also works by pre, called Prefab. What they do is they use the technology of Seculi, which reverse engineer your pixels from images to labels to widgets, and they will recognize the behavior, and then you can do interesting things with them. But the limitation of this approach is that they can only operate on the surface of your application. If you want to change something underlying the logic of the application, it becomes very difficult. Here's another approach. You can use a toolkit-based approach, which allows you to touch the underlying software architecture. For example, Scotty is a, is a solution that allows you to modify the software using some scripts and, and change it. But the problem of that is it's tedious. It's very difficult to use. Not an easy solution for you to do. This comes with weight. Weight, basically, we, we add a GUI with a weight interface to allow you to make those changes without the tedious of writing simple, a lot of code. And if you compare weight with Scotty, you can, you can see that Scotty, it, although it allows you to modify the underlying structure of the code without really actually having access to it, but it does not have an ID to support it. If you want to translate, for example, a label from English to Russian, for example, you have to dig through its code hierarchy, UR hierarchy, and look through and probably spend many hours to figure out where exactly the label is, and then make the translation and change it. <coughs> and this comes what the weight can do much better. So I will try to do a live demo, and hopefully it works. Uh, and, and these, before we do them, we always have to warn, if it doesn't work, we have a backup video, you can see, watch the video. <laughs> All right, so this is the interface we have. Um, this is Paint.net, which is a software that you want to use. If you double click on, it, on that, you will see that this is the interface. It's uh, just a photo uh, editing software. Uh, actually, it's open source, but we use it for our purpose. So we can do it without looking at the source code. And you can modify it if you wanted to just regularly. And you can see that that's the behavior of the paint.net. But now, what I want to do is, I wanted to inject some spies into the software runtime process. So that allow me to retrieve some information from that. To do that, I will first use uh, the weight, okay? What I will do is I will run weight as administrator, and I will locate where this application is. So I will browse through, and paint.net is located in the program files. I load the executable of Pig.net into my application. Then what, I will install this new application. This means that I already sent a spy into Pig.net. And I will start this process. Once I start it, and I will start Pig.net again, 
And now you see this new label or menu button appears. It's the way. And you look at it, it actually has a number of functionality in it. So we're successfully sort of sending an agent into the runtime process of this program and try to get information from it. And once I've done that, I can start my video studio. Okay, this is already started. Let me just close that. I'll start it from scratch. This is Video Studio Ultimate. And I will start a new project. Windows Form project. So I create a project. You can see that this project has a WYSIWYG editing interface right there. Right? But it doesn't have anything right now. It's not that interesting. But because I already insert, installed a WAIT plugin into the Video Studio, under Tools, there's this WAIT button here. And I can ask WAIT to start listening, which means that now there might be some interesting thing. I can send it to you, now you start listening. And once I say start listening, the server has started. Now I go to pink.net. Let me just make it a little bit smaller. And in the wait here, I can say clone me. Okay. Once I click on that, you can see that there's some underlying complications going on. Now the Microsoft Video Studio has just extracted the user interface part of pink.net and reproduced it in the GUI editor right here. All right, so now what I can do is that I can start to modify this interface in a way that I want it. For example, for my, for my dad, of, of course he's Chinese, uh, he doesn't really want English, English labels, so I can change this. Oops. Uh, I will change this to Chinese. All right, and I can also, I want to, rem I can change this to Chinese as well. Um, I don't need this, I don't want it, so I just delete it. I know my dad is not using these things. So I just delete those things and delete it, delete it. I know my dad will use uh, effects occasionally I know he doesn't look at the help, so I will just change that. Okay. And I think the font is a little too small, so I will change this to make it font a little larger. So all I do is modi 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 modify the property editor. Okay, now I make the font a little larger. And I know he want me to highlight this, uh, this little icon here. So I will make it a different color. All right, so I made some changes. I think my dad will like it. I just want to play one more thing. I want to add a little a new menu item here that does something. So I will just say the new menu item called say hello to Shen, okay? And I can add actually customized behavior to this, uh, to this little <coughs> menu item here. I double click on that, and basically I will just say message box show hello Shen. Okay, so that's all I have done. I, I made those changes, I think my dad will probably like it. Now what I would do is I would just generate that as a, as a dynamic add-on. So I ask wait to generate library project. Okay, that's done. And I will locate the library project. This is where it is. I will copy that. Now I go back to uh, pink.net. Go to wait. I will say install a new add-on. Putting does not exist. Uh, 
That's the danger of live demo. <laughs> okay, let me try it again. Okay, let's go to tools, wait, generate library project. Okay, now let's go here again. Copy it. Install new add on. All right, now it exists. We go to debug, we install this add on, open it, and here we go. It's changed as the way we just modified it. Okay. Um, of course, uh, when I close this window, uh, it was not stay as the same way as here. So let's just go to check if my new menu item still works. Here we go, it works. Hello, Shen. All right, and now what I will do is I want to make sure that every time my dad opens it, it stays that, that way. I don't want him to sort of install the add-on every time he opens it. So I said run install add-on as startup. Okay, now I close this application. So now you can see that this is checked. checked. So I close this application, and now I start ping down again. Here we go. It loads it as it starts and my dad will use this interface as he modified it. So this is basically how Wade can help you to change any, well, I always want to say any, the supported third-party softwares without writing a single line of code or write some simple code to add some behaviors to it. All right, so that's the demo. Luckily, it worked. Okay. Next. Well, once we, we are researchers, and once we did some uh, innovation, and we want to check whether or not does the innovation actually helped to make things better, we carry out some evaluations. Our baseline is Scotty, which is the interface that also can do the similar functionalities, but a little more difficult. We asked, we recruited a bunch of uh, students who are experienced in programming and compared their performances in making a few add-ons. And we asked them to do a number of different tasks. First task is reconfiguration. Basically, just change interfaces with certain properties. It does not involve adding a new add-on, new behaviors. And we find out this is the time differences between using Scotty, which is uh, the baseline interface, and Wave. We are about three times as fast as Scotty. And we want them to, um, to write in simple add-on interfaces that involve some coding. When you talk about coding, uh, both Scotty and Wade are more or less on the same starting point because they all need some coding. But because we're offering this very nice scaffolding of event handlers, coding is even much faster with uh, Wade as compared with Scotty. And if you look at average, we are about three times as fast as traditional approach. Now I think you are all geeks, you are in interested in how this exactly works, right? The way it works is we first create a, a weight manager, which is managing the, 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 the spies or agents. We send it to the runtime process, as you see here on the screen. And once that's done, when you load a host application into the weight manager, it sends a piece of code at runtime injected into the processor to take a look at what's going on there. And what it does is it extracts the GUI hierarchy from the host application, and then it clones at your IDE. And now you can modify the cloned project in IDE, and then after you finish modifying, you generate a library project, another DLL, and then you load it back using the weight manager back to the host application, which will override original behavior, so the new behavior become apparent. Well, this is an overview. You probably want to know more details. I know this is Geek Camp, so I will give you more details. Four steps. If you talk about an algorithm in a very high level, four steps. First is extract the GUI hierarchy information from the host application, then send this information to the GUI builder, and then in the ID, convert this information to be ID readable and allow it for modifications. And finally, we'll analyze the modification and then send it back to the host application, step by step. The first step, what we do here, is using a technology called DLL injection. 
DL in gas injection, what it does is that it basically sends the agent into a runtime of the host application. It first opens the process. Then you allocate some memory in the process that's already running. And then it will write to the memory with the DLL. And then you execute some code to affect its original behavior. So this looks, sounds like hacking, or maybe hackers or virus writers want to use such things, right? But it turns out that this is a building feature for many other platforms. The reason is, a lot of times when you actually having code, you have some legacy code from earlier on, you want to modify its behavior, but you already lost its source code. You really need a method to be able to allow you to intervene in the runtime. In addition, if you want to debug processes, so Microsoft used this for their debugging purpose as well. So this is actually used for very legitimate purposes. Of course, hacker can also use this to do interesting things. So that's the trick of how we can send a spy into the process. And once we send a spy into the process, we will do a kind of a tree walk of the original GUI hierarchy and get it to reconstruct that GUI hierarchy. Okay? And they will communicate that information to the GUI, uh, to the GUI builder, which is your software. Okay? We send that over, and then you can start to doing modifications to it. And the way it does is that it basically retrieves this tree object, okay? and then it sends it over. And the, on, the, on the other side, you will, re, you will read this tree, tree object and, and reconstruct everything according to what the GUI hierarchy is already having. And the tree object earlier we had, we will build an index of dictionary of all the components along with its properties. Once that's done, user can start to modify the new clone project. And now we run through a simple algorithm to find out what modification has already been done. So they apply back to the host application. So this simple algorithm runs as the follows. I know you cannot read the in, in detail, that I, I highlight each step one by one to you. First thing what we do is we just make every widget in the original host application invisible. Okay? Now it seems like everything is deleted. Make it invisible. If you want to delete anything, it's very dangerous because that will cause crashes. So we just make it invisible. And then we do a tree walk, right, right per first tree walk of every component, and we'll look it up in our original dictionary of components. We will look at the clone of uh, the tree, and we'll look at each component in the original list. If we find it, okay, if we find the corresponding one in the original dictionary, what we do is that we will just walk through all its properties and set its properties to the corresponding widget in the original host, and then make it visible. This is also including event handlers. And this event handler can be written by you as a new one. So this can allow you to add and modify things to the original widget, change or modify things. However, if you create a new widget, that widget does not appear in the original host applications. Then we have to add this into the original host application. And then also make it visible. So this is how you can add new components and new behaviors to your original host applications. So that's basically the steps for you to go through. It's a simple algorithm to allow you to make those changes. Okay. Now you know the basic steps on how this works. Uh, you may raise a question. We want to make the change of the, op change of the code simpler, change of the interface simpler. But if you still ask people to use an IDE, it can still be a little bit difficult because not everybody know how to program and they don't know how to know um, IDEs. Can we make it even simpler for people who maybe don't have programming background? Well, the answer is yes. We have another way to do it, which is we provide you with an add-on, and this add-on allows you to interfere or change the interface without even launching the IDE. So the add-on will basically go through the inject manager and change the interface on the runtime. And I will show you a demo again. And hopefully this will work as well. 
So earlier we already installed uh, the pen.net. So this one I will change the interface for notepad.net. So I will browse and find notepad.net. I will install this application here. And I probably need to stop it and start it again. And now if you start notepad application, you see that there's a wait uh, menu item already on the top. It just has the same, same process. Before that, it just, it's, not, it's not there, but once we register it, it has the wait. Now we can install an add-on. And this time, what I will do is I will install the property editor add-on. Okay. And I activate it by opening it. Now you can see it, the property edit add-on allows me just to looking through and making changes uh, without even using an open ID. If I, for example, I, I don't like the last word, I want to delete it, I middle click my mouse button, now a property editor will, will show up and I can make it invisible. Okay? Now this thing is gone. And I want to change for example, the font size of that. Instead of paste, maybe I want to change to Chinese characters. Okay. And I want to make the font a little bigger. Here it changes. I also want to change its background color. All right, so I think my dad will be now cannot miss this button anymore. And now I finish with it. Okay. I can close it. Now my dad can use this application without uh, going through the early hassles that I have. So you can change it on the runtime. All right, so that's the second demo. Okay. So now, finally, you can make changes to, your, to the desirable icons as you want it without going through the hassles of writing a plugin or hacking through the code. <coughs> However, I just showed you some interesting properties of weight and I think it's just some promises, but I also have to tell you the limitations. It's actually not working perfect and has a lot of problems. Uh, although I show you the all working parts, right? One thing that it does not support well is that it does not support well dynamic or custom uh, properties or custom widgets. It can, if you build uh, the interface using a Microsoft.NET uh, framework or Windows Form framework, you use the standard widgets for your interfaces, then Wade can work it pretty well. It will be, allow you to change and multiple things really easily. But if you write a lot of customized properties with custom classes and things, then it's very hard for a way to know exactly what you have changed. Unless it is derived from a common property, then way can know and it can still make appropriate changes for these basic properties. And another limitation is that if you, because we need to inject something and retrieve things in the beginning, if your windows are loaded after you already started your application, so there are secondary windows or tertiary window, windows, then Wait may not be able to know these windows and cannot apply those changes really well. Okay. So that requires additional work to make it better. Okay. And also, Wait is sort of supporting a limited number of IDEs. Currently support Sharp Develop 4.2, and Microsoft Visual Studio 2012 and Ultimate. <coughs> it also only supports the Windows platform, Windows XP, as well as Windows 7. The reason is that big different platforms have different mechanisms for DL injections. And if you have different ways, different security rules, you have to sort of go through that by yourself, one by one, to figure out a way. We, we spend a lot of time engineering to figure out these platforms. It need additional cross-sourcing powers to make it available for more platforms. 
Finally, I just want to acknowledge uh, the funding agencies to give us the money to allow us to do this research work, and as well as NUS School of Computing to provide a, a lively environment for research, and also my own lab, uh, all the lab members. Now I can take some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We think it is uh, time for questions. We have two microphones and we can run and reach to you if you have some interesting questions to ask. Uh, first question. On user interface or... Um, I think uh, I saw one tweet. Is the way we scheming of applications legal like DMC or active violations? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think if you customize for your own personal use, that's no problem. I don't think that's any problem. If you customize that and resell as a product, that may have some problems. Um, but the purpose we are looking at here is sort of customize for my dad or maybe customize for a small class of people. I don't see that as any problems. Yeah. Great. Yes. Like, uh, I just like to ask, like, what is the kind of future use case that this can be applied to? How feasible is it, uh, given the amount of money that's invested into the research and all that? You know, how far can this go to become usable in the real world? Okay, that's a very good question. So one thing, I think you asked this question because you're from the real world. <laughs> we are from the research world. Uh, we don't care about real world. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a very good question. Actually, honestly, I will have to say that 95% of research uh, may be buried in, in terms of papers. They may emerge and in sometimes later to influence the real world. Uh, a lot of that is in the form of ideas, and the ideas eventually will be propagated and transformed. For example, if you're looking at uh, GUI, for example. GUI was proposed uh, actually before Xerox FARC first got that is 30 years ago in research labs. And it takes about 30 years before it was you know, transformed by the Xerox lab and then was looked by Steve Jobs and then finally turned into a commercial product. Um, similarly, mouse was introduced uh, in the lab for 52, 53, and then it finally got used, become popular one after 10 years or 15 years later. So there's usually a gap between something appears in the research world before it becomes something that can be used by real world. But of course, that's, you know, that's just sort of try to uh, unload some of the blames for us. But I, I think uh, we do want to hopefully be able to contribute to the real world uh, by working on projects that can have a better impact. So I think one way is interesting is cross-sourcing. And I think the way I'm doing a presentation right here is hopefully some of you will be interested and we can share the source code um, if, if you like to, and we can work together to make it usable. Because it's honestly a tremendous amount of engineering work uh, just for a few students. Uh, it, it really needs a large team of people to make it really work for maybe a lot, a lot of softwares that, that's available and create customized solutions for people. Um, but in the research world, if you want to just not so ambitious to, to, to get everybody to use it or a large amount of people to use it, in the research world, there's already some usage in terms of software comparisons. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to find out that maybe such feature design is not so great, I want to run an experiment to compare a new feature with the original feature, but I don't have the source code of that original software. Right? I wanted to do an experiment on that. You know, using Wade, you can sort of making those changes, and you can still make the comparisons with with that without re-implementing their software because you don't have the source code. Um, this allows you to already find out some knowledge, uh, but to make it really useful for the public is still a long way to go. Yeah, very good question. Thanks. Thank you. I, I'm sure we have a time for a couple more questions. I'm sure as engineers, designing user interface is very much a part of our job to ensure that the common people uses it. Uh, Prof, maybe, do you have some recommendation of your favorite books on user interfaces coming from the research world? Okay, uh, I think you should just take my, take my class. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, they're, they're, it's, it's hard to say there's a favorite book for user interface design. 
Uh, one book I like is uh, it's called Rapid Contextual Design. Uh, it's a book you can find on Amazon. It goes through the design life cycle. Uh, it introduces different techniques such as contextual inquiries, uh, affinity diagrams, and personas. Uh, it's, I think if you wanted to, I, well, I personally think every programmer should go through some user interface training. Every programmer, because there's no way you're writing a program that's no users. Uh, and and I, unfortunately, it's still very much not being emphasized. Uh, the courses I'm teaching, CS3240 and 4249, are still electives uh, in, in the computer science department, which I think everybody should take. But it's also a dilemma. If everybody takes it, I don't have time to teach you. Uh, so, but, but I do think that everybody should, should learn that. And there's also a very good uh, tutorial you can go through, the Stanford uh, Design Thinking Workshop. That's pretty fast. You can go through that with one hour or two. And then you already get a sense, a quick sense of how do you actually design user interfaces. I would recommend everybody to just go to their website and go to the Stanford uh, Design Thinking Workshop. And you can even try that. Uh, I run a few of that uh, in one day or two with different groups and I, I find it uh, very, very effective in terms of give you the most amount of UI training in the shortest amount of time. So you can, you can try that. Thank you, Prof. Um, I would personally like to attend your lectures one day, and I'm very sure a lot of them also have questions for you, but you'll be hanging around, uh, wouldn't you? Like, people can ask you questions sure, sure. personally. So give it away, from Prof. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you have one more question? Or? Ah, ah, sorry, one more. One last. How's one? Uh, I just have one question. You said something about if you open another window after the application has already started, you will not be able to detect a certain window. There are certain apps which open multiple window instances at startup. Is Wade able to detect all the windows? Uh, that's, that's possible. It's just a timing. Uh, because the Wade is injected and then at the time it will take a snapshot. It does not do all, uh, active monitoring of the opening windows. Uh, so the current information, you just take a snapshot at the beginning and then you, will, you can modify based on that. Uh, but if you open multiple windows at the start point, Wade can still handle that. But if you have later on, because you don't know when a window will be open, you need to write a monitoring program to know that, to be able to monitor that, to change that. So I open all the windows and I take a snapshot. That's fine. All right, uh, thank you, Prof. Tao, once again, for the insight into user interface. A huge round of applause for him.